I am super glad that you're here. Welcome back. I, we are talking tonight about small groups. So if you don't know who I am, I'm Shannon Keebler. I'm the moderator of our Facebook group online. I'm the creator of the Math Genius Squad, which is a professional development membership for math expressions users. And I am a teacher just like you. So we are talking tonight about small group. What is small group? How do we use small group? And so let me get us started. This happens to be one of the hottest topics that I get asked questions questions about, which tells me that we really don't see small group instruction as something that is natural part of our daily block. It's something that feels forced or it feels like it's extra. And so I want to kind of clear some of that up and talk about what it could look like and hopefully share some information that just makes life a little bit simpler. So here we know about small group. So small group tonight, we're going to talk about what does it mean? We're going to talk about examples of when to pull students. We're going to talk about how easily to pull them, what small group could look like, and then any additional support. So that's our goal for tonight. We're hoping to get through all of this in just here a few minutes. So let's start with the basics. Okay, what is small group and what is not? This is going to be the simplest explanation you're ever going to hear. Okay, if you have all of your class, it's not small group. If you have anything other than your entire class, you could call it small group, okay? So small group could look like 15 kids with me, 15 kids working independently at their desks. Small group could look like six kids with me, everyone else doing independent work. Small group could look like six kids with me and I have rotation station and kids are actually rotating. So small group in the context of tonight could mean anything other than the whole group, okay? So it does not mean it has to be rotation station. Now it can be rotation station, but it doesn't have to be. So let's look here at some more basics. How long should small group be? Well, that varies. It depends on your needs. So in just a week, actually next week, we're going to be running our reteach method workshop. And I actually just finished writing it. I'm really excited about it. It's probably the simplest I've ever made the entire reteaching model in terms of how to do it from start to finish. I've simplified it into seven steps for you. And we're going to talk about this more. So make sure you've signed up for that. I'll tell you more about it as we get going here. But when we talk about how long it should be, it should really be as long as you need it. Sometimes when we're doing a small group, we're pulling kids and we're saying for literally responsive, like five minutes, two minutes, I'm checking in with this group of kids and I just need to do a touch in. That's part of being responsive. It can be considered small group. Small group can also be when you've already spent time building understanding. So let's just say you have been teaching the lessons, okay? It could be on a daily basis. Like you're in the middle of a lesson, you've done a couple of activities and you've already spent time building, but you know that there's some students that just were not tracking with you. There are some students that are ready and ready to go independent. And there's other kids you're like, they're not ready to be independent. Right then and right there, we can be responsive and we can pull a small group. Okay, that's responsive small group teaching. It can also be when you need to dive in deeper, meaning we have more of like a procedural fluency day. So remember that in expressions, you have a couple of these. There are days in which we're building concepts. Okay, it's a lot of whiteboard work. It's a lot of math talk. It's a lot of build, draw, write. Like there's a lot of like, we're just trying to figure this out. But then there's actually what I call a procedural fluency day. And a procedural fluency day, you can actually identify this straight away in your table of contents. As you're looking in your big ideas, you'll notice that it says like practice and apply. It's a stop and practice. Like you've been doing long division, all the different methods, and all of a sudden it's like practice long division. Those are procedural fluency days. It means we're not really building understanding, we're building fluency. So students don't need more methods or they don't really necessarily even need to talk about it more. They just need to build fluency with it. That would be an example of I'm going to pull small groups that day. I'm going to let other groups work independently. They're going to be working on building that fluency, but I need to go deeper with some students that just did not catch on to even the methods. They might need more conceptual understanding while other kids are building procedural fluency. So I find those procedural fluency days to be really good small group days. I also find really good small group is when I'm teaching the lesson in that responsive piece 
right? And the math expressions guide will say something like, and partners have students and small groups have students. And remember, there's like the little picture of the heads, okay? If you're in the new copyright, it's up at the top of the, the workbook page where I'll show you like what the key is. Uh, if you're in like a 2013 California, 2015 version, you're gonna see it's in a red box next to each section of the lesson. And it's gonna say whole group, small group, partner, class, okay? Now you don't have to follow that guide always, but that's a really good indication of if it's saying partner, independent, or small group, that means it is assuming you have built understanding enough that kids should start now to practice and apply without you. Now, it doesn't mean you're sitting at your desk. It just means you're not holding their hand through every problem now. They need some time to be independent, see what they can do on their own. You might do some quick catch and release, right? So I like to call it catch and release in terms of I catch you, I give a little bit of instruction, you go off in partners, maybe in some small collaborative groups, maybe independent, and you go practice a short section of problems. During that time, I'm working maybe with one of the small groups because they need a little bit more guidance. Okay, then I, so I released you, but now I'm going to catch you again. I'm going to pull everyone back and we're going to check in on those three problems before I release you again. So it could look like even like that, right? So now I want you to look at a couple other things as you're thinking about small group. The other one is if you are in a reteaching cycle. So these are based on the responsive lesson. In my lesson, as I'm teaching in core, during core time. Okay, I'm working on these two. This is during core, but intentionally in that when reteaching cycle. We call it the mastery learning loop in math expressions. This is when I've taught all of the big idea. Lesson, 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 lesson. I have a quick quiz. I do not keep teaching. I give the quick quiz. The next day, I do not teach. I now go to reteaching. That is a day that I could be in small group for the whole day. That's a great day for station rotation. That's a great day for 15 kids with me, 15 kids of the carpet. It can look however you want, but if you can't figure out how to pull those small groups during your lessons, maybe it's just very overwhelming for you. It feels like a big task. Then you should at least be doing it once every big idea for the duration of the entire core math block. So all of these are small group ideas for core instruction. And that's really the goal, my friends, of the small group time for our reteach method on Monday. So if you've signed up to take that workshop, that's really about that core. Now I address what happens for intervention. That's separate. That is different. That is students that are below grade level. They are tier two, tier three students. They need small group instruction, not the same. Okay, this is for tier one through tier three of core grade level. That's what we're talking about tonight. Okay, so small group made easy. Students in collaborative groups and you moved each group. So here's something that it, when I talk about rotation station, I think that's what gives us the sweats, right? We're like, oh my gosh, it's like so much work. Like I have to have all these stations made. And then we think Pinterest and we think teachers pay teachers and they have to look cute and have all these. No, it really doesn't. Okay, so in this case, look at these three examples. Students in collaborative groups, meaning everyone's working on these three problems that you've given them. You've given them norms in those groups. Maybe you have made them ability groups for today because you want to intentionally meet some individual needs as you go to those small groups. Maybe they are mixed levels groups. That's my favorite way to go, where students can be helping each other. And instead of students rotating, you're rotating. Okay, so they're just working at their table group and you're moving to groups to facilitate, to ask questions, to clarify understandings, misunderstandings. That can be small group. The next one is pull students as needed without planning, meaning you didn't even plan on it. But as you're doing this intentional teaching, you're noticing a few friends keep getting the wrong answers. They don't know what's happening. And you're saying, everyone else, I want you to go ahead and start these next problems. Susie, Sean, and Howard, meet me at the carpet. Okay, you're pulling students for a moment to clarify what they didn't understand. That is small group. Okay, you didn't even have to plan ahead for it. It was in the moment, moment you're being responsive. But it can also be very intentional and very data driven. This goes with the last example I just gave you on that previous slide of now we have a reteaching day. I've taught the big idea. I administered a quick quiz on the last day of that big idea. I sorted that data and now I'm ready to pull small groups based on how they did on that quick quiz or other formative assessment. Okay. So 
That's a big one because of course we want to be intentional and we want it to be data driven, but it doesn't always have to be that. It doesn't always have to be this huge production. It can be very responsive during your core as well. So as talking about core, keep in mind, okay, core instruction is sacred. So that means we are not, oh, let's go back. We're not pulling students from core instruction where they're not going to their EL teacher. They're not going to their special ed teacher. They're not getting their double dose of reading during that time. No, this is sacred time. So if it's a core time, then students are there for the entire core time. K2, that's 70 to 75 minutes because you have daily routines. You have an additional 10 minutes. Now, does that have to be consecutive? No. A lot of teachers in the primary do 15 minutes in like the morning, like a morning meeting, quick practice, daily routines. Then when they have their core block, it's another 55 to 60 minutes. And that's where they do like the bulk of their teaching and activities. Okay. Or you can do it consecutively. Grades three through five, really grades three through six, it's 60 minutes. That means this is untouched time, right? Kids are all getting access to the core and like, but some kids can't even access it. Well, if kids can't access the core, there's two things. One is we have to give them the scaffolds to, to be able to access. Yes, they can do long division, just give them the multiplication chart. Or yes, they can do, right? They can, they just don't have the right tool. You might have to give them two digits instead of four digits. There are some things we can do so they can continue to be with the room or with the class and be accessing, or they are getting all of their core instruction from a different teacher. So if they're using a different program, like a true tier three kid, a student who has maybe some significant IEP needs, and that teacher is providing both their intervention and their core needs, then of course they may not be in your core during that time. Okay. But that's a really important component. As you think about small group is you're going to need more small group, the more you don't have this because you just don't have enough time. All right. So what can it look like? Let's give a couple more examples. I've given you several, right? Remember small group is any time you're not with your entire class. So you can see, this is me here. Kids are working in these collaborative groups. I'm the one that's traveling to them. Okay, I'm the one that's coming around, asking individual questions, checking to see who understands what, so on and so forth, right? I'm the one that's going and having students pull to me like on the carpet or to the kidney table. I have kids maybe in small group rotations, right? It could be that I've intentionally planned 15 minute stations and I'm going to see every group for 15 minutes. It could be that, but it doesn't have to be. And if it's going to be that... Whatever kids are doing when they're not with you should be something they are independent on. It can't be instructional because if it's instructional, then they can't be held accountable and they're going to be knocking at your door and a line at your desk the whole time. Okay. So it has to be something where they're, they're on their computer doing IXL, iReady, personal math trainer, not my favorite things, but it, that's an option. If you need them to be independent, it's working on small group things or procedural fluency from earlier in the unit, homework and remembering the remembering side of the homework, a great activity for kids to be doing independent. Lots of options there. Regardless, your next steps, don't overcomplicate it. I think we're getting literally the sweats because we think it has to be these stations and we have to have all these things for kids to do. It when every time I do stations, it takes me like the whole math block just to explain what they're supposed to be doing. I mean, what a waste of instructional time. Okay. So I introduce like one, maybe one station, like one fluency game and everyone knows how to play it. And we've been playing it as a group together, like every Friday for 10 minutes, they finally, everyone knows how to do it. I know they know how to do it. I can now put it as a station because I know kids can do it. And that's it. Everything else they're doing is something they can completely do on their own. I do not have to explain it. Then I might introduce something different. And now I start planting that as, okay, now it's a new station, like accounting collection. Okay. So, but I don't, inter if I have all these stations and they constantly are changing, I'm constantly having to explain and I'm having to make sure everyone can do it independently. It's too complicated. It's doable, but it's too complicated. So if you're trying to simplify this year, which is my word for the whole year, simplify, then I want you to think about these small windows of time, even five minutes of, I can pull that quick group. I have 10 minutes at the end of my math block. Everyone's working independently. That's my intentional time of touching base with students and pulling little groups. Great opportunity. And then of course you can get all the additional support. So if you're thinking to yourself, how do I get all of this done? Because I just went fast. I just kind of brainstormed, really I just brain dumped on you several things that you might be thinking a little bit differently now that it doesn't have to be this huge orchestrated event, right? If you're thinking that then, then you really do want to sign up for our workshop next week. 
Okay. It's the reteach method. There's some information here for you. It is Monday, January 13th. It is at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. That means it's 4 o'clock Pacific. That's 6 o'clock Central. That's 7 o'clock Eastern. It's $19. This is where we're going to take you through the seven steps. And I'm going to go into way more detail. I'm going to slow it way down. Okay, I've super simplified this. So if you do the reteach method, you're going to get, first of all, I'm going to have a 90-minute live training. So you're going to come live. If you can't make it live, it's okay. You're going to get the replay. You're going to have it forever. Okay if you sign up for it. But really, if you get live, you're also going to get a Q&A. There's extra things you're getting if you come live. All of this, we decided to throw all of this into this because I get so many questions about it. So all of the planning support, we're going to give you the graphic organizers. We're going to give the teacher note documents. I'm going to give you all of the different outlines of the different types of stations you might do, what you might do in those, like the most simple ideas to put in those if you're going to do it. You can see actual rotation stations. If you're going to do something like that, like every once every big idea or every Friday when you have a win time, like there's a million ways to use this. I'll explain those. So we've given lots of those types of ideas in this particular replay. Plus, if you decide you come live, we're giving you all the objective trackers. So remember I said, hey, you can do small group based on data. Okay, so I've plugged in the data pieces. I actually really love this document because it has every grade for every grade for every big idea. It lists what those big objectives are. Those check for understandings. There's a lot included in this where you can track, like, did they get it today? Did they get it today? Did they get it, you know, like whether it's an exit ticket or just hold up your whiteboard and tell me. I'll explain how this works on Monday and our reteach method and talk about the various ways you may quickly and simply collect formative data and keep track of when they finally get it. Because that document in and of itself is what you can use to pull your small groups. Okay, so if you come live, you're gonna get all of that for every unit. All right, I am super excited about this because it's not just small group. Like we reteach throughout the math block. I don't think we realize we're already doing it. But I'm gonna give you a really simple process. It's seven steps. And then with that, I'm going to explain some of these other pieces that just feel really overwhelming, specifically the small group station rotation situation. If you're interested in that, I'm going to give you some resources, tell you more about it. But I'm going to really focus on how do you know what to reteach, who to reteach, when to reteach, and how to do it. Like, how do I pick? They didn't get anything right on the quick quiz. Now what do I do? Okay, so we're going to talk about that on Monday, and so I hope to see you there. All right, my friends, so glad to have you today. Thanks so much. Bye for now.